Well, well, well. I think this calls for a celebration. Got the, the OG here. This one's for you guys. Cheers. That is delicious. So let's talk about Euphoria. <laughs> Euphoria is an HBO television drama series written and directed by Sam Levinson that started in 2019. It focuses on a group of teenagers in high school as they navigate the trials and tribulations of modern youth struggling with trauma, drug abuse, violence of all sorts, etc. Some coin it as the new Degrassi, but it's safe to say that this show has taken the world by storm and is maintaining an enormous amount of success. Shortly into the first season, the second season was greenlit, and the same is to be said about the third season, being renewed after only a few episodes of season two. Fans praise the series for both its careful but honest handling of tricky topics and its incredibly stylish and sexy presentation. From the cinematography to the makeup artistry, the euphoria look um, became a staple for Gen Z and younger millennials and quickly bled into the trends for seasons to come. People really love the show. I love the show but it's headed towards failure. Season two, despite its troubled beginnings during the pandemic, failed to recognize the things about the first season that made the bones of the show so excellent and released eight new episodes of spectacularly inconsistent quality. So I wanna talk about it. I wanna preface the rest of this video quickly by saying I generally and genuinely love the show. I think it's one of the few television shows that I wait week by week for. I consistently rewatch it and I think about it for days after the credits roll. It's the type of show that I, as a person who works in the art department in the entertainment industry, would be honored to work on. Perhaps that's why the failure of season two was so jarring to me, so upsetting that I had to spend days upon weeks writing and researching about it and talking about it and editing a video on it. <laughs> I'm really desperate to kind of find out what went wrong here, and I hope this video interests you. I don't want this to come off as mean-spirited, as always, if you disagree with me on any of my points, I encourage polite discourse in my comment section, and if you like what you see, please let me know by liking the video, commenting, or subscribing. All of those things are free, and they help the growth of my channel, so cheers to that. Oh, and obvious spoilers. Spoilers, spoilers. I will be unashamedly spoiling every episode, every plot thread, all of it. I think it's best to participate in this video with having the context of seeing the whole show. So you've been warned. I've organized my thoughts into a numbered list because it seems to work out quite well for other YouTubers and video essayists. So let's give it a whirl, shall we? Part one, Genesis. In an effort to understand what went wrong with the show, we have to understand what went right. Beyond that, we need to understand who created it, who wrote it, who directed it, and where they came from. In the beginning, God created Sam Levinson. Sam Levinson is an American writer and director and the son of film director Barry Levinson. His father has had quite the career, and you may recognize some of his work, um, described as mid-budget comedy drama films such as Good Morning Vietnam, Diner, Toys, and many more. He's amassed many awards for his work and he's received generally positive reviews for uh, most of his films. But before you get ahead of me by trying to say that I'm trying to make a nepotism baby remark, that's not my point. I'm just trying to paint a full picture of where he came from. Sam has been open about his struggle with drug abuse in his early teens and early 20s. As he summarizes to the crowd at a Euphoria season one premiere in 2019, quote, I spent the majority of my teenage years in and out of hospitals, rehabs, and halfway houses. I was a drug addict, and I'd take anything and everything until I couldn't hear or breathe or feel. He goes on to describe himself during that time, quote, I'm a liar, I'm a thief, I'm an addict, I've been shitty to almost every person in my life that I love, and I had a moment where I thought, I don't feel that way inside, I think I'm a better person than that. He's now been clean for 17 years. Congratulations, Sam. Cheers. <laughs> In that specific discussion to the audience for the premiere, he talks about moving from drug to drug to find his productive flow, because even in full-blown addiction, he loved to write, he loved to be creative, and he never lost sight of his passions. So this actually led him to use crystal meth. He was able to maintain a productive creative lifestyle while high, and this seemed to be his rock bottom. It's clear the way that Sam talks about the person he was during that time, that Euphoria is a direct and deep personal cut from his own experiences. It's a deeply personal story written to leave very little up to the imagination. 
it's unflinching at its core, which I think is the main characteristic of the show that makes it so compelling to audiences. Previous to Euphoria, Levinson's claim to fame, as it were, was writing and directing his second feature film called Assassination Nation, a satirical black comedy thriller about a group of high school kids trying to protect themselves from a malicious hacker that begins to post revealing personal information about the whole town, including themselves. I've seen this film myself and it's okay. Levinson has proven that he shines in writing convincing and intriguing young people that keep you invested in their stories, as well as their interpersonal chemistry. It maintains a strong visual aesthetic, which makes sense because the cinematographer is the same for both this film and for Euphoria. There are actually quite a few recognizable faces in here if you're familiar with the cast of the show, which was a fun surprise. There are actually a lot of skills on display here that are also in Euphoria, convincing but annoying teen dialogue in just the right way and a blend of technology and the visual language of the film that doesn't feel distracting. A strong color palette and high intensity edits make this a really fun watch, but that's sort of where it ends for me. It's really obvious that the script is trying to be way more important than just a good looking experience with good looking people, but the messaging rings hollow by the end of it, since its themes of we live in a society are whispered during the violent screaming match of this film, and it doesn't end up taking precedence over everything else going on. Overall, at the time of its release, the film didn't end up making its money back in the box office and received mixed reviews, praising its stylish presentation and surprising dark comedic tones with fun, tongue-in-cheek moments, and frowned upon its feminist themes and theses that are drowned in male gazy schlock. Clarice Lority for The Independent writes, quote, Every point the film wants to make has to be roared via lengthy speeches and declarations made straight down the lens. Any deeper meaning becomes lost. When the fires finally subside, there's not that much to be found in the ashes. Or as Hannah Strong says for her review for Little White Lies, quote, enough with the feminism as male titillation, please. To share one final review for the film that got a little more attention, Katie Walsh for the Los Angeles Times summarizes the film by saying, quote, but it fumbles the feminist commentary that is just so embarrassing to watch. The filmmakers have the gall to spend nearly two hours assaulting the audience with sexualized violence, only to turn around and offer up a patronizing lecture on the contradictory social conditioning of women as some kind of girl power rallying cry, like it's a novel relevation. Dude really tried to mansplain the virgin whore paradigm in the midst of this exploitive claptrap. Ouch. To add a final sting to the swirling negativity around the film, during the premiere of Assassination Nation, Sam Levinson got up to talk to the audience and forgot to thank his wife, Ashley, also the film's producer. Levinson claimed in interviews that this didn't spur into a full fight or anything super messy, but he still looks back on the moment with embarrassment and cringes at himself. In an interview with Refinery29, Levinson explains that, quote, we only talked about it on the ride home, but I couldn't stop thinking about what happens when you forgot to acknowledge the contribution of someone so integral to the process. We'll bring this up again later, put a pin in it. Anyway, in June of 2017, HBO announced that they're planning on developing an adaptation to the Israeli television drama Euphoria. It came out in 2012, ran for one season, 10 episodes, and it's about a group of 17 year olds with very little adult supervision, doing drugs, having sex, and causing trouble. It's really hard to find this show online in English, but I did find a few episodes with Hebrew subtitles. Strictly from a visual standpoint, because I don't understand Hebrew, the show has a real skins appeal to it. HBO said that Sam Levinson was expected to write the adaptation and loosely adapted the source material by combining it with his experiences as a teenager with anxiety, depression, and drug addiction. It was described as kids meets train spotting and what might exist when parents don't exist. I think this is in reference to the original show because they specifically left the adults of the kids out of the show, even visually doing a peanut style frame cut off of each of their faces to leave them just out of you. And surprise, it was a huge hit. I mean, I thought it was a blowout hit from the start, but if you look at the Google Trends results for Euphoria, it explodes in popularity at the start of season two. The hype was enormous, audiences were obsessed, and hungry for more after a long break between seasons. And did it hold up the hype? No, I don't think so. Part two, the narrative. The first season of Euphoria functioned mostly through the eyes of our main character, Rue, as she decides to not stay clean after going to rehab. In the beginning of the second episode, she explains, when I get high, I think I'm psychic. She goes on to begin each of the eight episodes with character introductions of one of the key characters in the show. The season starts with herself, Rue, 
then moves on to Nate Jacobs, Kat Hernandez, Jules Vaughn, Maddie Perez, Chris McKay, and Cassie Howard. I think this is a super clever way to organize the show. We get key information about character backstories without it needing to be represented in the current narrative. And it's not shoehorned exposition either because we expect each character to get their time in the spotlight. And as audience members, we can move through the rest of the show knowing those things about the characters and have more context on their behavior moving forward. It seems obvious, but it's a free pass to be as transparent about each kid as they need to be. Plus it's a fun viewing experience to see each character as a younger version of themselves and each of their own important life moments. We even learn non-necessary pieces of information about each character, like the fact that Cassie loves ice skating or Maddie's mom is a nail artist, but it makes everyone more well-rounded and convincing. In the first season, there are deep distinctions between main characters and side characters because the main seven people are super well fleshed out and everyone around them, for the first season at least, functions only to make those seven characters' lives more believable and realistic. Of course, seeing as there are only eight episodes per season, not every character could get an intro. We had still yet to learn about Lexi, Fezco, Ashtray, and Gia. Moving into the second season, fans were actually really eager to learn more about these characters, ideally in the same format where we could get a good deep dive into what happened to them to make them the way they are. Season two, though, chose to format the episodes in a different way. The season starts with a great flashback for Fezco and Ashtray, and we gain a really deep understanding of his upbringing with Fez's grandmother and how he took over the family business in a way, leading him to become the town's drug dealer. Episode two has another character introduction for Nate, except instead of catering it around his childhood, it centers more around this sudden desire and love for Cassie and his interest in starting a family with her. Get to that in a second, a uh, second pen. So I guess it's technically a character intro, but it was a repeated one and in the grand scope didn't have a real need to happen. The third episode has one for Cal Jacobs, describing his first crush on a boy on his wrestling team, Derek, while dating his soon to be wife. Accidentally getting her pregnant forces him to live his life as a straight man and push down that very important part of himself. Okay, that's, that's pretty good. We learn a lot about him moving on to the next. Oh. There, there isn't another one. That's the last character intro for season two. They attempt to flesh out Lexi's character by giving her a thing to do and also give her a side plot romance with Fez. Gia doesn't get the attention she deserves and the season introduces a character, Elliot, that we end up learning nothing about from beginning to end. As of the day I'm writing this, it's been announced that Dominic Fike, the actor that plays Elliot, will be featured in season three, so I guess there'll be an opportunity in the future to learn a little more about him. The show worked so well under this organized format, and when it decided to throw it out the window for whatever reason, we're forced to move from character to character and plotline to plotline in each episode. It becomes a crazy mess of information, and by the end of the season, you realize that none of it even mattered in the first place. So much of the stories were cut for sizzle over substance, and it ended up spending a lot of time on vague plot lines that ended up going in circles, meaning that a lot of these characters ended up right where they started. Speaking of cutting for sizzle over substance, there are far too many edits in this season that feel like they linger for way too long, almost as if each extra second is padding the runtime for an episode that turned out to be way too short. I'm particularly thinking of the length of some of the more tense scenes like Rue's chase, or Cal's argument with his family running on for a little too long to the point where all the tension you started the scenes with ends up melting away by the halfway mark and you're kind of left standing there waiting for it to end. There are also decorative shots like the beginning of episode seven where they announce this is an overture. Hey guys, this is the beginning of a play. Let's tell you that with no changing visual information for just under a full minute of screen time. I swear to God, I had to check my HBO to make sure that it didn't freeze or something. It's just so unnecessary. Rue's narration amongst the scripts varies in consistency as well, which I think may be a way to represent Rue's drug addiction getting worse, making her less coherent and less able to narrate others' stories, let alone her own. This is nodded to at the end of episode four where Jules narrates the last line of dialogue in the episode. Since before we ever existed. 
and the only line of dialogue that she gets to narrate for the whole series. This is interesting, but ends up causing some annoying problems. In episode six, once Rue has made her way past withdrawal and stayed sober for a bit of time, she begins narrating again and brings up Jules and Elliot, but quickly moves past them because she's still upset at them for snitching about her to her mother. This is a joke and is played for laughs, but is frustrating as a viewer because the plot decided to spend so much time of the first half of the show on Rue and Jules' romance, and then the Rue, Jules, Elliot, weird love triangle thing. So to spend all that showtime on those characters and that specific conflict, then to just avoid it in the end means it never fucking mattered to begin with. Theoretically, it would have worked to have an Elliot character intro in that episode or the episode before, so the viewer could parse together the end of that plotline with character information that we would have learned from his past. Kind of like what we got with McKay. Part three, the characters. I guess the only way to summarize the way I feel about the characters in season two is that I can just tell that the scripts were shifted around and rewritten a lot. The characters' previous plot lines from season one wrestled with the direction that they were taken in season two. Characters went from falling off the map entirely to behaving in ways that don't make sense based on what we already know about them. So this requires some digging in, so let's get into it. The characters are sort of junkated into their own little spheres. Nate, Cassie, Maddie, Lexi, Fezco, and Rue, Jules, and Elliot. I'll start by saying that the Nate, Cassie, Maddie thing works for me overall, but Nate and Maddie both sort of turn into new characters while Cassie melts into this unbelievably irredeemable and unlikable person. Nate goes from malicious, manipulative, popular football dude to meek, shy, lone wolf kid. Think about the way he talks in the jacuzzi scene. Why are you saying no? Um, because we're not. But we're not back together. Uh, yet. He's suddenly so shy and embarrassed in front of everyone he used to be able to control with just a few choice words. Old Nate would have said something like, shut the fuck up, I'm done talking about this. And he would have avoided the conflict in front of everyone so that he could get the upper hand in private. This I wanna be a dad Nate also sort of comes out of nowhere for me. After the jacuzzi scene is the insane moment with Cal, Nate's father, and they mention in voiceover that having Cal out of the house was so freeing for Nate, and he feels like this weight has been lifted off his shoulders, but it just ends up returning right away in the next episode. Still protecting his father's actions in a way, making sure his father is saved so he can take over the family business. This area of, sh of the show in the middle really gives me whiplash because we don't see these emotional changes. We're just told them through voiceover without seeing a buildup of what could be causing the back and forth emotional shifts. Whipping out a gun to force Maddie to give the disc back just to give it to Jules and have a quiet and compassionate conversation between her and Nate, where he's really vulnerable with her, but still is ending up lying by omission. His character is just really confusing, but not in a way that I find very appealing. Like instead of being a deep, complex character with a lot of shit to work through, which is probably what they were going for, he reads as a character that's designed to be able to make large move changes to keep the story moving along however it needs to. He's like the in case of boring episode break glass character where he'll seemingly out of nowhere go from zero to a hundred. Cassie has this completely outrageous character moment during her hookup timeline with Nate where she feels so paranoid that Maddie will find out but somehow believes that she could take her. She's crazier than her. You don't Crazier. This moment feels so laughable looking back on the rest of the season. Her character is honestly just the personified version of a worm trying to wriggle off of a hook. It's sad and hard to watch, and you know, it's it's tricky to see her attempt to defend herself in front of her family because we're supposed to agree with her family. I mean, I hope everyone agrees with her family. Here's the thing, not every character needs to be likable. It keeps things interesting to have someone change the way Cassie changed, I understand that. And I understand why she was written this way, but what doesn't work for me is the fact that Cassie doesn't go through an arc of recognition or redemption. The Maddie and Cassie fight fizzles into an anticlimactic moody questioning through a bathroom door, then to a nosebleed where they sit in silence in the bathroom. We get it, she's messy. We're supposed to see how messy she is. We see her in love with Nate, we see her sending 100 texts, we see the desperation, we see the drunk escapades, we see all of that. So. I've, I've gotta ask, why on earth was Nate the one to have the whole fantasy about Cassie getting pregnant? What we already know about Cassie from the previous season with her relationship with McKay is that she wanted to be a mother. She didn't want to get the abortion. She says herself, What if this is what I'm supposed to do with my life? I'm not saying I'm gonna have a baby. 
I just wanted to dream about it for a minute. Having Cassie fall deep in love with Nate and start thinking about being a mom makes complete sense and ties the relationship with a goal. For what we have now, there is no real love from what I can tell. It's a combination of attraction and taboo, I shouldn't be doing this behavior. That's it. I think I liked Maddie's character arc the most this season out of everyone. I like that she goes from never wanting to work a day in her life to recognizing that she doesn't want to stay in East Highland with these people that are holding her back and she ends up getting a babysitting job to build her sense of responsibility and maturity. Learning those skills through work means that she'll be able to use them during real life applications such as I don't know, when your best friend fucks your ex-boyfriend. I find all of that realistic enough, although splicing the fight where she finds out all of this happened during Rue's intervention scene causes a lot of mood swings to occur where we see it go down over four episodes. She goes from shock to anger to sadness to pure cool maturity very quickly. More quickly than I'd expect from Maddie. Lexi, in my opinion, isn't a strong character to begin with. I know people love her and she's so popular and she's the underdog, I get it. I'm just less than convinced. Using her play to learn about her is a good idea in theory, but not in application. There are a few good moments in this play for sure. I really liked getting her perspective on the ice cream scene that we saw in Cassie's character introduction. Cassie remembers that moment really fondly as one of the few good times with her father. And we see that Lexi has a much less positive feeling of this whole thing. And it ends up actually being a moment of trauma for her. That's super effective. But I think it's a little less interesting to see her on a stage talking about herself and her issues and the way she views herself moving through life rather than seeing it, say, through Rue's mysteriously all-knowingness. Maybe I just really liked that part of the show and it's really sad to see it go. I would have liked to just get a little more of her writing the play as well. Honestly, as I'm talking through it, I really just think the character developments were really misaligned this season, super uneven. The show feigns attention given to Lexi and Fezco, but we get a a few scenes over phone calls. We get two talking scenes over eight episodes. It's just not enough for me to really believe that they like each other. It's really just not enough to tell me that they like each other. I also need to believe it too. Fezco is a great character. I think Angus Cloud plays him in a super straight, way that's really appealing and realistic. I understand the appeal of having actors on this show that aren't actors, you know, they're just people. I know Angus was actually just caught off the streets of New York. Faye was picked up from Instagram, we'll talk about it. But to put a relationship on a character that plays so straight requires a bit of a deeper performance or at least deeper writing. I think by the end of episode eight of season two, we get quite a bit more of Fez and Lexi and I, I believe it more than I did by the end of the season. But it's supposed to grow and I feel like it stayed the same through so many episodes and then we got a ton of information in one episode which of course ended up being a very dramatic episode for Fez. So that reads really TV to me where they're not building to something greater, just kind of like shows its hand. I feel like the relationship depends solely on intimacy. Not physical, but we needed Fez to open up to her a little more. He does by the end of episode eight, but what we know about Fez's life isn't shared with Lexi. Fez says in the first episode that he thinks she's great. She's the smartest person in the room. He loves talking to her. That's all great. Why wouldn't he? However, why should Lexi be completely charmed by what Fez has to say? Lexi is a bit of a quiet artsy theater kid, so it's not unrealistic for her to swoon over the bad boy, but I think this relationship exemplifies the main problem with the season in the first place. Assumptions made by the audience do not equate to good writing. Why, after Fez beats the pulp out of Nate at the party, after spending all night talking to Lexi, do we not get a shot of Lexi running after him, texting him after the fact, therefore making a direct connection of his bad boy behavior to Lexi's attraction to him. Or the other way, he's a soft boy with a dark past. He's the type of person that shouldn't have to deal drugs. He's too nice for that. We don't get much of Lexi encouraging him to do anything other than what he's doing. She listens to his aspirations, but it doesn't move forward from that. The two of them just kind of ignore that part of them, okay? Rue, as our main character, goes through a deepening of her drug abuse, causing her addiction to spiral out of control and she ends up taking her friends and family down with her. Jules is dating Rue by the end of the first episode of season two, where she's using regularly. We know from season one that not only was Jules's mother an alcoholic, but we also know that 
Jules wasn't comfortable with having Rue in her life when she's on drugs. This is a push and pull in season one because when Rue is clean, Jules feels the pressure of keeping her that way as if she's a pseudo sponsor. As a child of an addict, I find it ludicrously hard to believe that Jules couldn't tell that Rue was zanned out every moment of every day. It's unclear to me if Elliot was actually an addict himself or just a casual drug user for fun, but if Jules was spending plenty of time with him as an active drug user and knowing that Rue has been hanging out with him for a lot of time, why would she be so focused on the possibility of them being romantically involved as opposed to the more obvious problem of a person with addictive tendencies hanging out with someone he uses regularly? It's so obvious to us as viewers that it's frustrating to watch her be so clueless. The show attempts to rectify this by giving Rue the presentation scene where she explains step-by-step step how to hide drug use by using marijuana as a soft launch of sorts, but is this really supposed to work? I, I get it, I know that Rue is supposed to hit a rock bottom and we have to follow her through that. I don't doubt that addicts are people with altered brain chemistry that lead them to believe that they're masterminds that can hide anything and make anyone do whatever they wanna do, but I'm not convinced. Elliot as a character really only operates to get in between Rue and Jules's relationship. This is obviously a messy character plot line that I don't really wanna get into that deep, but if Jules behaved like a person who paid a little bit of attention to their partner, that cheating three-way relationship thing wouldn't need to happen to get Rue into an intervention with her family. They all begin to hang out together as a threesome, but it has this weird knowing undertone to it. And they decide to lug Rue around in a journey of stealing a 24 pack of White Claws from the liquor store to then chuck the box in the back of the car where Rue is sitting to then be surprised when Rue grabs one for herself to drink. I'm not saying Rue should be drinking, obviously not, but why would Jules do that? Why did she suddenly become so clueless about behaving around addicts? It, it really just makes my head spin. Poor Gia is completely ignored once again. Now that Rue's addiction is hitting rock bottom, Gia is once again thrusted into a chaotic and stressful home environment with her sister, always getting into trouble, getting into screaming matches with their mother. We get a great line when Jules is moving through her withdrawal. I feel like I don't know anything about your life anymore. I'll tell you when you get back. I think that's a really beautiful moment. But after that, we get a throwaway line from Leslie explaining that Gia's grades are faltering and she's obviously being directly affected by the drama Rue is causing. Why didn't we get to see any of that? Last season, we got a few moments of Gia at parties, participating in casual drug and alcohol use, and now that's all supposed to be coming to a head for her but we just get a telling moment instead of a showing moment. I feel like it's a bit of a missed opportunity. Finally, Kat is just completely missing from the season and she takes a drastic and infuriating character turn where she determines that she's no longer happy in her relationship with Ethan for vague reasons. I think what we're supposed to know about that is that he's too nice, I guess, and that's kind of where it ends. That's sort of the final consensus we're supposed to land on, and Kat's storyline wanders between this unhappy relationship thing and this self-love thing, which doesn't really have much to do with anything, and doesn't grow over the course of the season either. It's spotty coverage at best for her changing emotions, and she awkwardly fails to break up with Ethan straight up and fumbles together a lie about having a brain disorder. The whole thing is such a mess, it actually makes me angry even thinking about it. <laughs> but after the breakup, she's like back into being a cam girl and she's right where she was again, but for what purpose? Initially, she stopped camming because of the creepy customer that forced her to reveal her face and she felt uncomfortable by the new lack of privacy. But realizing that her boyfriend was too nice doesn't push me back to camming being the solution. I don't understand this leap. I think maybe a solution to this could have been like exploring her relationship with Ethan in a more dominating way. Maybe she would have been meaner to him or asked him to do more sexually promiscuous things that he wasn't uncomfortable with, then realizing that that's a direct clash and they don't belong together, I guess. But it's all internal and we don't go on that journey with her. It's just taking place over tiny, tiny, tiny scenes of her speaking with Maddie over the course of the season. And it's really, really bad. Part four, the drama on and off screen. During the break in between seasons one and two during the pandemic, Sam and Zendaya wanted to make something together that would be able to be shot in a short period of time with a small crew of people, with an intimate cast, 
that could theoretically be acted in Zendaya's own home. They move on to work on his next feature film, Malcolm and Marie. It's about a fight between a couple following the man's premiere of a film he's directed after he forgot to thank his girlfriend and his muse during the film's thank you speech. Does that sound familiar? Malcolm, in the middle of the movie, receives his first review for the film and moves into a full-fledged screaming match with himself, ripping apart the fairly positive review line by line, consistently disparaging the, quote, white woman at the LA Times. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. It turns out Malcolm and Marie got mixed reviews as well, with uh, Roger Ebert saying in his review, quote, the first 25 minutes of Malcolm and Marie are mostly sharply written and Zendaya and Washington add what feels like history between the lines. But I'm not convinced we learn anything more in the following 80 minutes that we didn't in the first 25. Oh, there's some great monologues, but Levinson allows the focus and pacing of the film to get away from him. The whole thing starts to feel increasingly like the voice of a writer and not two separate characters living real lives. Malcolm and Marie is a film written and directed by Sam Levinson, really just to ramp on a negative review that he received three years ago. It reminds me of that moment you have in the shower where you're thinking about what you could have said to that one dude you were arguing with that one time that would have absolutely eviscerated him except you're like 48 hours late to that argument. It's a little embarrassing, but most definitely vulnerable for Levinson to be so open about his damaged ego and his inability to accept critique as a filmmaker. So how does this merge with the drama on set? It's been rumored that Kat's character was supposed to have an eating disorder storyline, which she wasn't on board with, allegedly. This turned into a fight between her and Sam that caused her to storm off set, which allegedly, caused most of her scenes to be cut or edited out or maybe allegedly the scripts were rewritten to keep her character in a backseat position. This hasn't been proven by any real sources, but it makes sense because of one, how absent Kat is this season, two, how her character made a drastic change and then moved right back to where she was during season one before her relationship with Ethan, three, the fact that Barbie Ferreira wasn't present during the season two premiere with the rest of the cast and four, the proven inability to handle criticism that Sam Levinson has represented in the past. This type of alleged drama is made more believable by its reinforcement of previous behavior from Sam. I think it's also worth noting that Sam writes Euphoria and writes alone. There is no writer's room. From what I can tell, the only co-writer in the entire series was for Jules's special that was released in between seasons one and two, which was based on a poem Hunter Schaefer wrote while she was in high school. That special is excellent and it doesn't feel like it's missing Sam's fingerprint on it but it has a marriage of handling Rue's addiction at the end of the special, bumpered by an honest and vulnerable therapy session with Jules. Euphoria works because of its honesty. Sam is pulling from his life to write Rue's character. It's grounded in reality, which makes it so compelling. Jules' therapy session is some of the best moments for her character in the whole show because we get to see her just talk and be really honest and open about being trans and wrestling with the way she sees herself versus the way men see her and how Jules dresses to appeal to the male gaze, which is tied with the amount of self-worth she believes she possesses. Hunter Schaefer was invited to write on an episode that was heavily Jules-centric to make it more honest and believable. Hunter was able to write about what she knows. So what about the abusive relationship moments? What about the eating disorder moments? What about the drug deal moments? Well, Sam writes those. It's understandable to me that Barbie Ferreira, who plays Kat, would be aggravated that just because she's the only plus-size character in the show, that her plotline has to revolve around her relationship to food. It's also understandable that if this was already written into the script, that the way it was handled may have been surface level. Because, I'm sorry, Sam, even if you've been affected by eating disorders yourself, it's still not coming from the same place as the other things you're pulling from that make the show so great. You've never been a plus-sized woman with an eating disorder. You can even tell that in some of the behind the scenes content for the show that it just feels like Barbie doesn't really know how to defend her character's stupid plot. Ethan is this really nice guy. He really loves Kat, but he doesn't give her that rise that like, you know, going on, uh, camming websites or exploring like casual sex. I think that's really what she's battling this entire season is like a really internal fight of what Kat wants. Good for her for trying to save face though. Another swirling rumor revolves around the Jules and Nate storyline being dropped. It's speculated that Hunter Schaefer and Jacob Elordi, the actors for Jules and Nate respectively, don't get along. Jacob and Zendaya dated for a brief period of time and allegedly, 
Schaefer knows some stuff that went down between them and took Sunday aside and doesn't really want to share scenes with him anymore. This is supposedly why Nate had a romance with Cassie instead of Jules this season. But this is all speculation and again, hasn't been confirmed in any way, but I find it kind of interesting because the only scene they end up sharing together is one where Nate is giving the disc back and Jules is still very upset and not willing to forgive him for all his wrongdoings, despite the fact that they should theoretically both still be in love with one another as hinted by Nate's line in the scene and also by Jules Jules's lines during her special, where she's speaking to her therapist about Tyler, Nate's catfish. For what it's worth, everything I ever said was true. Same here. It's a quick way to wrap something up that would have been really interesting to open into. All of these accounts are third party sources at best, but seeing as how much attention all of this drama got on Twitter and Reddit, I personally think the cat drama specifically is really believable based on what we know about Sam. What we saw on the show didn't diffuse these rumors, but actually made them more believable. If I learn any new information about any of these speculations, I'll keep you all posted on my YouTube community page. Part five, HBO boobies. The show's on HBO, it's gonna have some nudity. It's a bit of a running joke on any popular HBO show like Game of Thrones or the like. There's a bit of nudity in season one. I'd say it's pretty even in female and male anatomy represented. Maybe my memory isn't serving me correctly, but what I know for sure is that it wasn't distracting. I can't make this any more clear. The amount of nudity in season two of Euphoria is not only distracting, but one step away from pornography. It's overwhelming in every scene particularly the early episodes in this season, and I'm actually inclined to believe that the pushback from the audience for the excessive nudity caused some edits in the late season to occur because it really calmed down by the end. And I'm not a prude by any means, but there were plenty of moments where I was on my couch watching it with my boyfriend and I couldn't even look at the screen because I was so uncomfortable. Faye, played by Chloe Cherry, as I said earlier, was supposedly scouted through recruiting for the show and claimed that Sam Levinson saw her on Instagram and thought she was super funny and wanted her to read for the show. That may be true, but what we know to be true is that Cherry is also an adult film actress who after season one starred in a Euphoria parody pornography film playing Jules. Maybe Sam saw the film. Maybe he noticed that she was an actress that was comfortable with being nude and scouted her on those facts alone. We see her nude a few scenes after meeting her. So, there we go. There have been multiple sources pertaining to the excessive use of nudity in the show, and the actor is needing to ask Sam to pull it back or cut out scenes where they found it unnecessary. Sydney Sweeney is definitely the actress in the show that we see nude more than any other, and she's been quoted saying that she had to ask for scene edits for topless scenes that she didn't deem appropriate. Apparently, according to both Sweeney and Minka Kelly, a side character that plays a glamorous young mom that Maddie babysits for. When they brought up the fact that they didn't want to do the scenes, Levinson didn't fight it, he didn't force anything, and immediately removed the scenes with no questions asked. That's great. I have no problems with the way that he handled that. Uh, that's a good thing. I am not saying it isn't. It is definitely expected that if you're dealing with young actresses on set, that you have to put their own comfort and boundaries above what you believe is best for the show. But most importantly, you need to cast these people with no false pretenses on how they're expected to perform. But I, f I feel like I can't talk about the show without talking about the nudity being a topic that's front and center most of the time. These actors are all adults, but they're playing teenagers in high school. I understand that teenagers have sex and to pretend that they don't is silly, but in the first season, the amount of nudity that they choose to show got the point across that these teens are promiscuous without making the viewers feel like perverts. Kat's character goes through an entire sexual journey, gaining self-confidence by exploring casual sex and dominating behavior, and we don't see her naked at all. It gets the point across nonetheless, and personally, I don't think that would have been bettered by seeing her breasts. Part six, verisimilitude. I love that word so much. Verisimilitude. It's defined as the appearance of being true or real. Not necessarily whether or not something is real, just the likelihood of it being real. The believability of a situation. I believe season one of Euphoria is hyperdramatic, but still feels plausible and legitimate. There are quite a few moments in this season that took me so far out of the narrative that I had to look around my living room during episode premieres in disbelief. As said before, I believe Jules not being able to notice Rue's persistent drug use is unbelievable to me. I don't believe that she wouldn't be able to tell. Cal's drunk driving binge in episode four is obviously used to make the episode more tense, but it's so outrageous to me. There are not one, but two long scenes of him soaring down the roads, weaving in between lanes, skirting around like a maniac. 
And you mean to tell me that he wouldn't hit a car, a pedestrian, a mailbox? He wouldn't find a police officer on his way home to the bar, then back home? It's just so stupid to me. Episode five is a truly tense experience from beginning to end, cataloging Rue's rock bottom moment, getting found out by her family and being on the run while going through withdrawal symptoms. We follow her from house to house, desperate to find not only drugs to eliminate her symptoms, but also anything worth stealing so she could settle her debts to Lori for all the missing drugs. But it kind of gets a little silly. She smashes through tables, she runs through a backyard wedding and drops the cake and causes loads of chaos all while somehow outrunning the police. I think the police are as capable as the next guy, but to believe that they can't seem to catch her despite her huffing and puffing and clutching her side, even with the plot armor of adrenaline on her side. It's just not realistic and takes me out of it. And honestly, some of the moments during that chase even skirt on the slapsticky side of things. Lexi's play is an okay plot device. We'll talk about that more in a second, but it's obvious to say that the budget for this play is absolutely unrealistic. Uh, I'm willing to let that slide just because it's a show. But speaking of the school play, the lack of school this season season is pretty noticeable as well. I think that was also contributing to the strength of season one. These characters went to school. They were seen at school often. They participated in school sports and activities. They went to dances. It gives a sense of structure to the characters and allows them to have a change of scenery to get away from characters they may be having conflict with, etc. The only school moments we get in this season are with the play and montages in the hallways and bathrooms. I don't think there's any class time at all. Nate doesn't have football, Kat and Ethan seemingly don't share biology class together anymore, or any class. It just is missing to be missing, but I don't think anyone really understood how important it was for the realism of the characters to have them at school. Also, I, I gotta ask, why wouldn't Rue tell her mother during the intervention moment that the drugs not only didn't belong to her, but it's a much more serious situation than that? I, I don't understand why Rue is choosing to be so cagey about this. She's already been caught. I mean, you know, the charade is over. This is serious. And she knows that Lori isn't fucking around. Rue's life is on the line. And in a time of serious stress and vulnerability, like in the moment where she realizes that the drugs have been flushed down the toilet, sure, I'd be pissed, but you would have to explain sooner or later that you were trying to sell those drugs on behalf of someone else that will kill you if she doesn't get the money. She's in true danger because those drugs are missing. It was so infuriating that Rue was saying that they weren't hers, but wouldn't continue with sharing the actually important information. Part seven, Lexi's play or the last two episodes. All right, so I'm gonna go off script here for a minute because I actually just finished episode eight. Like I was saying earlier, I think the act of having the play isn't that big of a problem. I think it's a smart idea to give her something to do. I wish we got to see her do it more, like writing more. I think the plausibility of Lexi being kind of uncertain that this would cause a huge problem is sort of ridiculous to me. I just, I keep second guessing myself and getting anxious like if people are gonna think that it's good or bad or if it's gonna upset people. <laughs> But despite all that, I think the structure of episodes seven and eight, which also behave as the finale, end up being incredibly disorganized. And I don't love the way that we jump in and out of timelines and we go from real life to theatrical life. And there's also quite a few moments in the play where there are scenes that she's writing that she wouldn't have known anything about. So there's a little bit of like a dramatic irony of her having this all-knowing presence of Cassie's life and Maddie's life and Rue's life and getting all of those experiences that we learned as viewers, but that she theoretically wouldn't know. I get it, it's a show, but it tended to establish rules and then choose not to follow them. There's an all-knowingness to the play that I think only made sense when Rue did it because Rue used that as sort of like a superpower for her drug psychic episodes. When she was high on the bus on her way to school, she'd be able to know things about people. And I feel like Lexi having that same power of, for example, writing about Cassie on the carousel or Maddie and Cassie in the funhouse mirrors took me out of it quite a bit. This Elliot thing though, oh my god. 
I, this gives me like Vampire Diaries energy where they recruit people on the show that have bands or like they're singers or something and then their managers, you can feel their hand where they're like, hey, they've got a single coming out. You need to get them singing on the show so we can sell more CDs. So we have to sit through this like really dumb song. <laughs> Sorry. It's not my taste. Let's put it that way. It's not my taste. It's a little too long and it's written as if it's not finished, even though it had a full bridge. It was worth it in the end. I'm still working on it. <laughs> like, it was stupid. I don't know. I, it just felt like, oh, we have to remind everybody that he's in a band and that he needs to sell CDs and tickets for his tour. Episode seven was a little bit of just a disorganized mess. Um, we were jumping all over the map and all over timelines and we ended up not learning very much about anything. And episode eight had an awful lot of finishing to do. All in all, I think episode eight was okay. I liked the way it started. I thought it started pretty strong. I think Fez, as unfortunate as his end was, was a full plot line that we got the beginning, middle, and end to. And Nate, despite his ups and downs that I couldn't really follow throughout the rest of the season, hit his breaking point and established his end mark. And a big thing happened. Cool, I'm good with that. But what about everyone else? Again, Cassie and Maddie had a fizzle, a total fizzle of a fight. For Maddie to claim that she's literally gonna get violent and like literally murder her just for them to sit in silence in the bathroom, it doesn't feel earned. And I don't understand the grace that, that Maddie chooses to give Cassie because we've learned about her character that she, she wouldn't do that. And even in her newfound maturity, I think she would actually just like stand over Cassie and be like, I'm too good for this. like fuck you, see you later, or whatever. Or like, I'm too good for, for you two, or have fun with the disaster that you just started. But she just kind of leaves it hanging and it doesn't, it just doesn't work. Rue ends in a really nice way. I love their conversations together with Lexi. Jules is just like, her entire character just turned into someone who's like staring. Like she's just like constantly staring and crying. All she does is kind of do this. I really like her character and she was such an important part of season one that to see her just kind of like be like a plot convenience character by how stupid she is. And it's unfortunate that her character was kind of pushed to the sidelines like that. To focus deeply on Lexi's school play ended up making everything so disorganized and didn't give everything enough time or dignity or respect to really flesh out all of those stories that needed to be fleshed out. If we're going to spend so much time on the Lexi and Fezco relationship, and, and Fezco ends up getting arrested, I think, by the end, or at least taken to a hospital, why don't we know anything about Lexi's opinion of that? Was she upset he didn't show up? Was she kind of in like a fuck you mood, like fuck all men type of mood? Was she worried? Was she scared? Did she know that something bad must have happened? We didn't get anything. It was just ignored. And I get it. Season three is renewed. There are opportunities to showcase this later, but you have to you have to cap it. Like there needs to be something that will encourage the growth of the relationship moving forward instead of just ignoring it and letting it hit the floor. I hope that made sense. I don't know. I, f I feel like I'm kind of riffing now, but I'm I'm actually curious about what some of you guys thought. So let me know. Part eight, what I liked. I wanna make this clear once again that I love the show and there are still pieces in this season that I really liked. I love the fact that they shot this season on film. The showrunners actually contacted Kodak as a company and asked them to reopen their factories to reproduce the discontinued film stock Ektachrome. It lends this beautiful dreamy quality to the visuals, pulling warmer colors out and making the skin of each character just bloom with warmth. The colors are beautiful as always, and they sing on film. The cinematography is a truly important part of the DNA of the show, and the season is no exception. The camera offers a presence that is definitive, but not distracting. And frequently I'm left questioning, how the fuck did they get that shot? The fashion and makeup of the show is a signature mark as well, and maintained its integrity and specific aesthetic while still evolving with the characters. 
And uh, Jules is a good example of this, showing her change of hyper-feminine Sailor Moon style to a more explorative, androgynous look, while still feeling like these items would be in Jules' closet. I think I liked literally every single thing that Cassie has worn throughout the entirety of the show, and I don't even wear color. <laughs> even though I think Lexi's play is riddled with plot problems, I really enjoyed how ingenuitive and practical the scenes were. They really used the stage and made really fun and extravagant set pieces like the turntable for Lexi to strut on, and that was all really fun to watch. I appreciate the work that went to making those scene changes as practical as possible, such as the switches from play life to real life with the actors and characters sharing the set, making the switchovers seamless. In episode structure, it made it confusing and kind of annoying to follow, but artistically, I admire the final product. There's also a moment in the play with a mirror that took me a second to realize was practical. Really beautiful. The music is great, as always. I liked most of episode five, and I think the tension remained at an all-time high, even at the frustrating moments I previously mentioned during Rue's run-in with the police. It elevated the stakes for the series, and for Rue, and not a moment too soon. We, we needed that episode. The scene in the church during episode four is probably my favorite in the entire series. I remember getting chills uh, watching Rue sway alone in her kitchen as if she's dancing with her father. I liked the pilot quite a bit as well, and I remember thinking that the bathroom scene was super exciting and prepped me for the rest of the season in a really positive way. Part nine, Twitter. I don't really think I have much to say of substance in this part, but I think a full deep dive into the show, and especially this season, can't leave out the character that Twitter.com played in the viewing experience. Looking back on those Google trends from earlier, I thought Euphoria was very popular during season one, but it skyrocketed during this season. And Twitter became a live commentary of sorts during each episode premiere. It's definitely fun to watch the show with a large audience of like-minded people, and it certainly birthed some absolutely hilarious memes, uh, some of which I will show you right now. But something interesting that I observed over the course of the season was the insane amount of yes anding that occurred from viewer to viewer, speculating everything about every character plot from the beginning to the end of the season, trying to figure out what shoe was gonna drop by the next episode. I noticed that the viewers were seemingly putting in more work into understanding the subtleties of the characters, the passing lines in the script, and putting visual cues together from previously established threads than the script itself. It excited me to read what other people were noticing and we'd all collectively get excited about what was to come. And then nothing would happen. Nothing would come. In episode six, when Maddie is in the closet with that young mother she's babysitting for, she gets a text saying that the mother will be home in 15 minutes. The camera lingers on an alarm clock and then, oh, did you catch that? That's a hidden camera, good catch. Once Maddie comes home in her bedroom and shares a tense scene with Nate, who's hiding there, the frame catches a sign on her wall that says, smile, you're on camera. Cheeky. Seeing one from the other must mean something really big. Oh, it doesn't. Minka Kelly's character gave Maddie the dress that she saw her try on through that camera. Okay. It was consistent to see the Twitter viewership fill in these visual blanks sewing together a web of drama and intrigue only to have the next episode meet our speculations only halfway. On the other hand, it was noted often by audiences that TikTok and Twitter viewers tended to have, shall we say, a nonsensical approach to the show's storylines. The consistent critique was that people would hold outrageous takes as truth while only jumping to those conclusions by lacking empathy or critical thinking skills. Honestly, for the most part, this is pretty true. This happened a lot after every episode. The common thread people were sticking on for some reason was that Ashtray had to be the third child in the Jacobs family photograph because I guess he kind of looks like him or something. I mean, we were given a timeline at the beginning of the season for Ashtray's age and his introduction into Fezco's family. And later we're given a timeline for the beginning of Cal's family. It so obviously isn't possible, but it really didn't stop people from tweeting about it week after week after week. The amount of nonsense takes got a little out of hand in the middle of the season, I think. Uh, we were all getting really excited. <laughs> Part 10, final thoughts. It's not easy to make something great. It's even harder to make something great again, even greater than great, but don't make the same thing twice. And with the added pressure of the hyper-popularity of the show to begin with among challenges of shooting high-budget television during a global pandemic, coupled with the drama that may have made its way onto set to change what the scripts were originally supposed to be, 
it's practically impossible. And even so, Euphoria season two isn't that bad. But in comparison to season one, it seems that all that made it stand out so much to begin with is missing from the show. The sparkle isn't caught in the light anymore, but rather painted on to resemble a genuine glimmer. It could have been perfect, and as an avid viewer and big fan, it's a shame that it didn't capture the same feeling as before. I don't think it's lost all hope though. And I'll certainly be watching season three, which I'm sure will premiere in like four years, so who knows what it'll look like. But no matter where the series goes from here, it's impossible to ignore the impact that the first season had, and had on me and my artistic practice and on the world and teen culture in general. The widespread appeal in our age group was so fun to participate in and I congratulate Sam Levinson and the entire team of the show for making something brilliant that I and so many others are so moved and inspired by. But we're the hardest on the things we love the most. I spent hours and hours writing this video, editing it, doing take after take, all because I care. It feels good to care. So no matter how negative I may have been in this video, I still honor you. And I honor everybody that worked on it. Cheers to Sam. I really appreciate you all watching this video. It means so much to me that you chose to spend all of this time with me and I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as I enjoyed making it. And I'm sure some of you may disagree with my takes and pieces of what I said in this video, maybe even everything I said. And in that case, let me know. I, I really wanna hear your disagreements in my comment section. And if you like the video, please let me know by liking the video, commenting what you thought, and subscribing to the channel. I'm actually planning on making more video essays in the future. I'm actually currently writing one on Disney animation. And I'm also watching a movie a day this year and doing monthly review roundups for each film. So if any of that interests you, feel free to subscribe. Um, but that's it for now. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.